The Fermi Paradox Part 5 A Cold Heart Not merely congressmen were unimpressed with SETI and its claims. Arguments against the existence of alien intelligence have dogged SETI since its beginnings. Very soon after the initial meeting in 1961, Sebastian von Hörner, a colleague of Drake's at the National Radio Observatory, concluded that, after accounting for self-destruction, or impacts, the most likely lifespan for an intelligent civilization meant that there were roughly 6,500 in the galaxy. That seems like a lot at first, but it means that our nearest would be 500 light-years away. Any communications with such a civilization would require a millennium for a single exchange of data. If we wanted to reply by tomorrow, we should have begun our conversation in the Viking Age. An even bleaker assessment for the presence of ETI would arrive in 1975, when astrophysicist Michael H. Hart published his strikingly titled paper, An Explanation for the Absence of Extraterrestrials on Earth. That's right, on Earth. Hart began his paper with what he called Fact A. There are no aliens on Earth now. To most people not currently wearing tinfoil hats, that would seem a common-sense assumption. But its premise burns much deeper than that, and its implications are far wider. Hart would go on to unravel this fact in a series of Fermi-ish assumptions, the first being that life is programmed to expand, and intelligent life is no different. Given the option and the ability to colonize the galaxy, any living organisms would do so, and would do so in the same way that they colonize our planet. Animals reproduce exponentially, and, if unchecked by predation, starvation, and disease, spread out exponentially as well. There is no reason to believe a species colonizing the galaxy would not proceed the same way. If one species sent out ten colonization missions to its nearest stars, each of those colonies would send out ten more, then each new colony would send out ten more, then ten more, then ten more, and so on. After just twelve waves of expansion, the number of interstellar colonies would far exceed the number of stars in our galaxy. Even assuming ETs had a million years to complete each expansion, that's still just 12 million years. A long time in human terms, but a lunch break when compared to the age of our galaxy. In fact, our galaxy is old enough for such pan-colonization to have occurred a thousand times over. And no, that time scale doesn't significantly decrease if you reduce the number of colonies per wave. Even if they went out two by two, pan-colonization would still occur in just 30 ways. In short, given the age of our galaxy, not only should there be aliens on Earth today, but they should have been here hundreds of times before. Right now, some of you are likely crying, but of course, don't you watch the History Channel? They've obviously been here before, and proffering links about Sumerian sub-tablets. Well, I'm afraid Hart addressed this idea in his paper too. Most ancient alien believers hold up evidence of alien presence on Earth, in the last 5,000 years of human history, or at most, the last 500,000 years. On the scale Hart is discussing, though, these times are meaningless. Galactic pan-colonizations do not have to occur on scales of thousands or even millions of years. If pan-colonization has indeed happened, it would have left geological evidence all the way back to the earliest years of our planet, billions of years ago. Even if only, say, 30 pan-colonizations occurred, the layers of civilizations and their effects would still be a dominant theme in our fossil record, and yet they aren't there. Hart then goes on to examine the possible obstacles that might prevent pan-colonization from taking place. And we shall be looking at those obstacles in the next episode.